reading it from input like you would normally do. In other words, normally input, get, button down, that's specifically tied to like your keyboard, like uh, input.get access horizontal, your left and right arrow key, right? That doesn't work on mobile. So the cross-platform input manager gives you this generic interface you can call against, and they've given you the code, it exists, and actually there's a prefab you can use. So let's look at that. Under standard assets, clear this out so we can see where it's at here. Standard assets, cross-platform input, prefabs, you'll notice there's a car tilt control, dual touch control, mobile aircraft controller, mobile single step, mobile tilt controller. Uh, so in this, I've taken these dual touch controls and notice as soon as I've enabled mobile, they show up in my scene here. So these are 2D elements that they've added and these will, you can hide these images so I can delete these images and ideally you want to do that. They're just showing you, hey, these are the areas that, that we're defining in your game. So what happens is when you have this enabled and you do a build, it's no longer reading from the keyboard. It's actually waiting for you to touch. Now this will not work in Unity's interface. If we click on play and we try to play our game here, right? I can't, like I'm moving around, clicking, it doesn't work. I'm using my keyboard, it doesn't work at all. It's essentially waiting for you to touch the screen, which the input.touch works on mobile. Um, specifically mobile controls here. So let me show you, if you build to a phone, you can plug in a Windows phone that's registered as a developer, say build and run, unlock your screen, and it will deploy right out to your phone. If you want the Visual Studio solution to work with, you just do build, and we're gonna cover this in the last module of the day today. But let me load up my phone here, and if you wanna see what's on your phone, you load the project my screen application for Windows Phone. I click on yes to allow screen projection, and I've got my Vamp Kid 3D here. Let me get it close to me so you can hear the audio when it loads up. There we go. So you can see the, uh, the icons here. For, I'm touching on the right here, turn, touch area. And if I press on the left here and move forward, goodbye. There we go. So those map to touch areas on the screen. Let me Alt F4 this application, close that out. So that's the mobile input controllers. It just works. You drag and drop them into your scene. And again, there's a couple different options you can choose here. Uh, I'm using the dual touch controls. There's also a single stick controller, tilt control. Drag them up in your scene, enable your mobile input, and it just works, as long as you're using the standard assets. If you're trying to in integrate the standard assets with some of your own code, you're gonna have to call, rather than using input, you're gonna have to use their cross-platform input class to read those in, instead of input.whatever. All right, moving on. AI, um, this is a funny term. Artificial intelligence. Oof. The funny is not artificial. Um, but it's intelligence because it's not really intelligence. If you look at most games, the logic in games uh, does something like this. Uh, if something is in range, do X, otherwise do Y, and uh, every now and then randomly choose some other op, <laughs> some other Z, some other action, right? Uh, take a zombie, for example, sit there idle, um, walk around, sit there idle again, scratch your head randomly, like every 10 seconds, do some random action, and then if the player comes within range of you, then pretend you're attacking, right? It's, it's a pretty simple process. It's not really artificial intelligence. Now, granted, there are games that have amazing, uh, seemingly AI in them, but for what you typically see on mobile and a lot of like desktop games, um, it's very, very rudimentary AI. That's why I hesitate to use the term uh, AI. Now, we're gonna look at uh, just like what seems to be artificial intelligence movement. In other words, uh, Unity's pathfinding system, which is uh, nav mesh, navigation meshes. And this allows you to move between areas to go from essentially from point A to point B. Um, you can go between defined navigation areas. So you have these uh, off navigation areas that you can travel upon to get from point uh, region A to region B. 
you can uh, be you can be defined to a particular area. You can say, hey, I want to be able to go up these inclines, or uh, I can't go inside of an area that my head won't fit. So there's all sorts of parameters you can specify here. Uh, there were there were pro only features in Unity 4.x. Well, when Unity 5 was released, uh, they did something that was pretty amazing, and they they made uh, the personal edition uh, have all the same integrated features as the professional edition. Of course, the professional gives you additional add-on features, analytics, cloud build, etc. cetera. Uh, but all the basic uh, in-game features that you're going to use are the same between the free version and the professional version. So you have all these really cool navigation things available to you. So let's look at um, a demo. We're going to look at our nav mesh Unity. And that is, let me go to my scenes. All right, I'm going to disable my mobile input here because we are not going to use it. Get out of 3D mode, out of 2D mode, I should say. You can see my bacon going on down there in the lower right-hand corner. And let that finish here one second. All right, now notice my mobile input just disappeared. And let's go to find my vamp kid here, or my, one of my patrol points. All right, we can make this pretty simple. Let's delete this guy. Actually, we'll just hide this guy. All right, what I've done here, the intent is I want something to follow the player. So let's play, and this is nothing new. We've got this little world here, and this guy can run around here. All right, now if I have an enemy that I want to follow my player or move between points, we need to tell Unity about these objects here. So let me just move some of these around a little bit. Because I'm just going to essentially break up some stuff. Now, we want to go to Window, Navigation. And in order to include something for navigation, it has to be navigation static. In other words, it has to be checked off navigation static. Uh, these other ones don't matter here. It's navigation static is what is required for nav mesh. If you have an object that you don't want to be included in all of this, then you simply uh, uncheck navigation static, and it's not included in the steps that we're about to do next. All of these here, I want Unity to include. In other words, I want some enemy to be able to traverse through this entire area. It doesn't have to be an enemy, right? You can have this, quote, AI or pathfinding on your main character as well. Uh, but we're going to do this with, with a little uh, enemy here. So everything is marked static, navigation static is all I care about again. Let me save this scene. And once you have your navigation window open, again, window navigation, you simply say bake. And it turns this pretty blue color, but you'll notice that there's kind of some gaps here on the side. And with your navigation settings, you can tell Unity um, what the radius, what areas you can traverse around areas, what height you're allowed to go within, what, what's the maximum slope that my characters are able to travel up. You'll notice this has um, too much of a slope here, more than 45 degrees. So it's not blue. This is not an area that the enemy is allowed to, tra to traverse up. And we actually have a problem here because uh, the enemy, as it stands now, can't get from this platform to up top here, which is um, a use case for the, uh, the off-mesh links. In other words, that's what you can use to tell Unity. You need to be able to travel between this platform, this area, and this area. We're not going to do that here just because of time, but we're going to look at some other things on how to use all of these defined areas. There's a lot of other parameters you can set on nav mesh. We're going to look at some of the basic ones here right now. So all we did, window, navigation, bake. And I just had anything I want included checked off as navigation static. Now, notice I only see the blue stuff when I'm on my navigation tab. Now I need something to actually use that. So let's go ahead and create an enemy. Um, of course, we could use a zombie here. But let's, I'm a fan of the uh, Indiana Jones movies. So why don't we create a big evil sphere? Crank this guy up. That's an evil sphere, if I ever saw one. All right, I'm going to move this guy back a little bit. Make sure in 3D space I'm really where I think I am. So sometimes I like to drop an object down until I see it pass through a surface. Because 3D can be a little misleading as you're working at it. You really have to rotate objects around to make sure you are where you think you are. 
But when you see that you're intersecting other objects, then you have a pretty good idea where you are. All right, so this guy, I don't need to enable physics on him. I don't need um, a collider here. I don't need a rigid body. I just want him to have some simple uh, pathfinding capabilities. And as such, on this guy, we're going to add a nav mesh agent. So think of a secret agent. <laughs> a nav mesh agent you need on something uh, if you want that object to take advantage of your navigation areas. Um, if you don't have a nav mesh agent, you're not moving in those areas. So you bake your navigation and then add a nav mesh agent to whatever character you want to move around, whatever object. So that's all we did here. So if we look at this sphere, we have a nav mesh agent. And this defines some areas, um, what radius we need to be able to go down uh, go through areas. If we have a really skinny area that's uh, maybe smaller than a half of a meter, we won't be able to go through that area. So we can define all these parameters on what size areas we can move through, what height we need to be able to go through areas, uh, how fast we can steer, how fast we're going to go. We're going to keep these um, at default right now. Let me save my changes. Now, when I play, nothing's going to happen because there's no code controlling this nav mesh right now. Uh, this nav mesh agent, I should say. It's just a component on a game object right now. All right? You can see them over there not doing anything. So let's add some rudimentary code. And I've got this navigator class. While that loads up, let's go ahead and take this code and show you one of the other ways you can add it to an object. We've looked at dragging up here. We've looked at dragging over there. You can do it here as well. And there we go. So our, our code has been assigned to Navigator. And let's look what that code does. It's super, super basic. Uh, when we start up here, we are storing our starting position. And then we are asking Unity for our player. And again, just to be consistent, rather than typing out here, I like tags.player. We're saying, get me my player game object, my vamp kid. And I want to know his position. So that's his transform.position. Now, I want a reference to my nav mesh agent component. In other words, on my enemy, get me this guy. Because I need to pass this component parameters of where I'm going to go. And then, once I have a reference to that component, I simply set the destination to be wherever the player currently is. So this is essentially, I stored those values. And now I'm saying, go to that location. Now, every frame that I update here, um, we have some code here to find out if we have arrived at a location. And the code looks like this. So you can find it on the net, or you can use my code. Path pending, remaining distance, and stopping distance. Um, are we currently on a path, or currently pending a path that we're navigating on? Uh, what is our remaining distance? And what is our stopping distance? So remaining distance, uh, we might have a, a distance of like three meters to a target. You can basically say on a nav mesh agent that you can stop within 0.3 meters of a target. Like you don't have to be right on top of there. If you come within 0.3 meters, that's good. And it's good to have a little bit of a, a so they say, a fudge factor here. Keeping that at zero, um, it's sometimes hard to stop right on an object, especially when you're dealing with float values and small positional uh, locations. Objects are constantly trying to move and get on top of each other uh, for these very minute locations. I like to say, hey, when I'm within like 0.3 meters or half a meter, that's good enough. Let's stop right there. So I'll save those changes. And when I arrive, I'm just going to debug log a little statement here and go back to my starting location again. So let's see what happens. Now you can see he's coming after wherever my starting position was. Let's get out of his way, because he's going to wherever my starting position was. <clears throat> and once he gets to that location, let's go to my console here. There we go. Arrived, done navigating. Now he's going back to the starting position. Now if I wanted to make this guy a little bit smarter, um, I could always make him go to something like this. Uh, I could cache my player's transform position and always make them follow that. So I could do something like private 
transform player position. I should probably call that player transform. It's not really his position, it's just transform. 